<laughs> Not everything I say is a pro of wisdom, believe me. Um, okay, so what I, I, what I thought I would do, since we're talking about business, um, I'll give you a little bit of a background on, on how I got into it and what I did, um, what I continue to do as a composer. Um, the, the first thing you'll notice, aside from the fact that it was a long, long time ago that I started, um, is that things have changed a lot. And um, some things have changed, and thems, some things have changed not very much. Um, I would say some ch the, the things that have changed the most have been the technical things. Um, for instance, when I began composing, when I was in school, when I was in your position, um, we didn't have uh, synthetic instruments. I mean, there was nothing. I mean, there was sort of the beginning of electronic instruments, but really the beginning, things that were hard to use, you had to plug things in and, and you know, fiddle around with sounds. Um, over the years, that became more and more standard so that eventually, over the years, we actually had new instruments to deal with and new sounds and new combinations to work with which provided opportunities for composers, which really were not available at all when I began. Um, the good news in all this is that I, I, even, even though COVID has somewhat um, modified this, there is a lot more opportunity for young composers and for people in music than there was when I began. And um, I'll give you an easy example of that. When I began, uh, and I'll, I'll give you the date so you can try to, I mean, I know none of you live that far except for maybe, maybe Rob. Um, I began working at, well, see, I, I graduated USC in 1967. Um, and I began working at CBS television in the music department the same year. So that's a long time ago, 50 some years ago. So you're saying, boy, this guy's really creaky and old, which is partly true. Um, at that time, there were three television networks. There was ABC, NBC, and CBS. CBS was the most powerful of the three. The most powerful meaning that it had the biggest viewership and it made the most money. And at that time, the three networks, they were called networks because um, as opposed to a single station like KTTV or, or um, KHJ, they were a network of stations. So they had, CBS had well over 200 stations, affiliated stations throughout the country that carried their programming. So that was what made it a network. That was what made it so powerful. And the way they made their money primarily was by selling ads on TV. So when you watch, uh, even today, when you watch CBS or NBC, if you should ever do that, um, you know, you get a lot of ads. Now Fox has ads. Um, local television has ads. There are a lot of ads. There are ads on radio. The reason there's so many ads is because that's the way they make their money. And if a show is popular, then the network or, or even the radio station can charge more money for the ads. Like for instance, when Super Bowl comes around, you know, the ads are really, really expensive because they know that they have hundreds of thousands, millions of people watching their programming. So all of these were commercially bound advertising uh, forward, um, uh, television networks, networks of stations. Um, and what happened eventually was that um, we had new technical advances in terms of television. It, it, the, the networks started to get competition. They really didn't have any competition um, to speak of when I began in the 60s or in the 70s. But then they had other little things like cable television came around. Cable television was a a new technological development where you didn't get the signal through the sky, you didn't get it through antennas, you got it through a cable. And cable companies started small, um, there wasn't much money in it, they didn't generally take advertising, but it gradually became bigger and bigger and bigger and the one that became the biggest of all the cable companies was HBO. Um, I forget, HBO I think is home broadcasting something, I don't know. Um, anyway, HBO became really big, and HBO now is the biggest of all the cable providers. Uh, it provides a huge amount of entertainment, um, live shows, um, documentaries, 
episodic shows, um, things that a lot of people watch, and it's a huge alternative to, um, to what the television networks were providing. Along the way, there were some other television networks that came out, but the, most, uh, the biggest one was Fox. Now, Fox is not as big as uh, CBS or NBC, but it, like the other ones, takes advertising and, and it's very popular. I mean, the news is particularly popular, but aside from the news, which is very conservative, um, you know, it has regular programming, which you've all seen and you know that. But, but again, it buys ads and it makes its money on advertising. HBO and um, the other cable shows don't make money on their advertising because they don't have advertising. They make money on their subscriptions. So if they have a lot of subscribers, if they have a lot of people watching their cable, meaning signing up for it and actually uh, having to pay for it, that's how they make their money. So you can work on cable. There are a lot of cable television shows available. There's, um, uh, there's the History Channel. There's, uh, I, I couldn't even tell what they all are. There's, there's, you know, there's sci-fi channels. There's home cooking. There's, um, you know, just about everything you can think of exists on cable. And they all are a part of some sort of cable um, payment so that if you if you buy your your cable plan from so and so from spectrum for instance you get a cable plan that includes yeah 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 yeah, yeah and then they they divide that all up among the cable users so as a composer or anybody wanting to work into this field um you have to know going in that the the, the largest companies are the ones that are able to pay the best because they have the biggest produced television shows um for instance i worked on a show uh, called um, Texas Rising that was done on the History Channel a couple of years ago. It had 10 hours of programming, 10 hours. I mean, that's really, that's a long time. 10 hours on CBS would have been pretty expensive to, to produce. On the Homeward, on the, um, on the History Channel, not so expensive. So um, the fee that I got and the way that we um, the way that we did the musicians and the, and the uh, recording all that stuff was a little bit different than we would have done had it been for CBS or, or ABC. So you can see everything financially starts to change depending on what you have. Now, since cable, there's a new group. Um, there's the streaming services like Netflix, uh, Hulu, um, whatever, all those. And they also are um, subscriber, uh, subscriber bound. And the way they pay is a little bit similar to what you, you get in the cable things. But the people who work on those, find, particularly the composers, find that the money is a little bit harder to get because the, um, the, the actual money they use to produce is so low that by the time they split it up to the composers and the musicians and all those people, it gets to be really small. So anybody who has anything to do with streaming, including uh, songwriters on the radio, finds that their income from streaming is a lot less than it used to be from you know, regular terrestrial uh, television or, or radio. So those things have changed, technology has changed. And um, when, I was, when I began, I said I, I graduated USC in 1967 with a Bachelor of Music degree in, in composition and um, got a job at, um, at CBS television. Now, the way I got the job was this. I knew nobody, and I mean nobody, um, in commercial music, except for one guy. And he was really sort of retired. Uh, he was a friend of my grandfather's. He had been a radio producer in the 30s and the 40s, which of course didn't help me because radio was already pretty much dead or given entirely to music. Radio used to be what television is. Radio used to have a lot of TV shows. And I remember as a, as a boy, as a little boy, listening to radio shows in the afternoon or on Sunday mornings or something like that, Saturday mornings. So I went to see this guy. He still had a production studio. He did a little bit of recording, um, but he didn't do producing like he used to do in the grand old days. Um, but I knew him and he knew me and, and uh, I'd known him for several years. So he gave me an hour or so of his time and he gave me his, his advice. The best advice he gave me, his advice I'll give you, is he said, Ignore everything I'm telling you. Just do whatever comes to your mind. <laughs> do whatever thing you can think of to get a job. It means call anybody, any idea that seems like a good idea, follow it up. And I would say that 
it was probably really good advice because whether you want to be a composer or whether you want to be a musician or whether you want to be a director or whether you want to be anything at all, it's a people bound business and you have to connect with people who will get you the job. So he gave me the names of three or four people to call and I called them all. One was a band leader. I really was not um, prepared to do that kind of work because I'd never done any arranging. I had a classical background. Uh, I knew very little about movie music, to tell you the truth. Um, I called another guy who worked for uh, a sound recording studio. And he would talk to me, but he wouldn't see me. He didn't want to take the time to see me. And I realized later it's because everybody sees so many people coming out of school that you know they're, they're, they're just used to making phone calls and giving advice and all that stuff. But he gave me an interesting thing. He said, um, he asked, he said, how old are you? I said, I'm whatever I was, 21, 22. And he said, are you married? I said, no. Uh, he said, um, do you play golf? And I said, no. He said, you ought to learn to play golf. And I said, why is that? Well, he said, golf is a very popular sport. Lots of people play golf. Producers play golf. He says, you'll go, you'll learn to play golf and you'll meet a couple of people there. You're going to meet new people playing golf and then you're going to start meeting producers. And as you do this more and more, one of these producers will become good friends with you. And then he'll invite you over to his house. And then he'll invite you to, his, to, to meet his daughter, date her. He said, that's the way you're going to get into the business. Okay, so I thought it was pretty funny at the time. But in a way, it's not so funny. I know a composer who actually dated the daughter of another older composer trying to get into the business that way. Uh, it didn't work, but he did get into the business. And he became quite a big deal. So it's one of those ways of contacting people. As it turned out, the third guy that he, that he got me on to was somebody who managed the music department at CBS. And he and I got on. And um, uh, there was nothing at that time, but a couple of months later, a job actually opened up. And I went on and interviewed for it, and, and I got the job, and that got me started. Um, I worked in, in a department that was pretty popular at the time. Uh, the composer, Jerry Goldsmith, had worked in the same department about 10 years before me, except that he had worked, already things were changing because he began working in radio. Uh, and he started getting into television um, little by little, but he was doing live shows and radio with little, little orchestras of like five, six people playing background to, to dramatic shows. Uh, by the time I got into it, we were doing shows like Gunsmoke, Hawaii Five-0, uh, The Wild Wild West, shows that you may or may not know or remember. Um, you can see them on television at three o'clock in the morning. Um, and my job was not as a composer. My job was as a, um, what they call a music supervisor, which even at that time was a different job than, than um, uh, the, the kind of a, a job a music supervisor is now. Um, sorry, I'm hitting something like that. Um, my job was to track music into the episodes that we produced, we being CBS produced, like let's say Gunsmoke or Hawaii Five-0. And what I mean by track is that um, what we would do every season, the season was 24 episodes long. We would make 24 episodes that would run through the entire season. And then at the end of those 24 episodes, the network would rerun them. So any show that you worked on would appear twice during the season. Seasons these days are not necessarily 24 episodes. Uh, they may be 12, or they may be even eight or six or something like that. Um, but we had 24. And so we would hire a composer to compose fresh new music for one of these TV series. And after we had about 10 or 11 or 12 shows in the can, we could use that as a library from which we could track. We could pick the music from those shows and put them in other shows. So if we needed a chase, we would go through and see how many chases we'd have, and then we'd see whether one would fit emotionally or dramatically with the show that we were working on and then we would put it in and then we would have to edit it and we would have to uh, make accommodations for time and speed and and you know all sorts of things and it was really an interesting way to learn how to put music to film because if something didn't work um, our job wasn't on the line it wasn't like i had composed it and i was never going to work again i would just go find something else until the producer was happy it gave me the, the um chance to work around a lot of different people under a lot of different circumstances and to meet a lot of different people and to see the reactions to music very differently. I had, uh, I had grown up in a household that was very musical. Um, I 
was essentially a pianist, although I also knew how to play French horn badly. My brother was a terrific trombone player. Um, everybody in my family played an instrument, played two instruments at least. Everybody could read music, everybody could sight read, everybody could sing. So I had a really musical family. A grandfather was a composer, an uncle was a songwriter. But it didn't, didn't prepare me in the least bit for film music or for, for commercial music um, or for utilitarian music. But I found by doing this kind of stuff of, of cutting up pieces of music to be able to put into new shows that music was in fact utilitarian. You know, what you needed was four seconds of that. You needed 12 seconds of that. And um, so that's what you were looking for. You weren't looking for great themes. You weren't looking for great meaning. Uh, you weren't looking to have anything toe tapping. You just want something that worked, which is primarily what film music is, is all about. Um, and in that process, <clears throat> um, it was interesting to see how people responded to it. Um, there's a story I tell often of a, comp of a um, producer. He was the executive producer of Gunsmoke, which was a, uh, was when it, Finished. It finished after 20 years. It was the longest running TV episode, a TV series in, in history when it ended. Uh, and it only ended because they thought that um, it wouldn't go any longer. Actually, it probably would have, probably could have lasted for a couple more years. It was really, really very, very, very popular. And this guy who was the um, executive producer had been an actor. He had been a writer. Um, he was a very decent guy. He, he had a great story sense. He was very good with his show, very, very creative. Um, and he was really the ultimate guy. He ran everything. So one thing we found out about him was that he would watch his show. And of course, he would have seen them many, many, many times because he would have known the script. He would have watched the dailies after they had been shot. He would have watched the first assembly of the show after it had been edited. He would have seen all the jokes, if there were any jokes, um, a dozen times or more. Uh, he would have seen all the sad parts a dozen times or more. He would have seen everything over and over and over and over again. It didn't matter with this guy how many times he saw the same scene. If it was funny, he would laugh like it was the first time. If it was sad, he would cry. And when I mean he would cry, I mean he would cry. Tears would actually come down his cheek, and I'm not kidding. I'm not, this is, I'm not making this up. Tears would actually come down his cheek, and he'd start to go, he'd start to sniff his nose and the whole thing, you know, and a little bit of sob. So he, I mean, he knew it was a weird thing, and he knew that people made fun of it, but that was the way that he, that he saw his pictures and that he could tell whether they worked. Where that became important for us was when we were on the dubbing stage, which was that process where we take the music tracks and the dialogue and all the sound effects and we put them all together into the final movie soundtrack. If he came to a sad scene and he didn't cry, if he didn't get any tears, he'd stop. And he'd say, now I've seen this scene dozens of times and every time I've cried, I'm not crying. And I, I'm not sure why, because everything in this scene seems to be right. Uh, the sound effects seem to be right. The dialogue is, is definitely right. And the music sounds like it's right, but I'm not crying. Something's not touching me. And he said, I know it's a funny thing. People make fun of me, but there's got to be something wrong. And it's got to be the music. So we'd say, OK, because we just had to find something else. So we would go back to our place, and we'd find some music. And we'd come down, we'd put it in. And if it was the right music, Sure enough, he'd sit there and he'd start to cry. The tears would actually come down and, you know, he'd start to sniffle and go, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, the guy who was in charge of that, the, the guy who was in charge of the music for Gunsmoke told me something that was really interesting. He said, you know, when I change the music, I don't change the whole piece. I just change the beginning of it. I change the part that gets him to cry. So if it didn't cry, I just change that and then I keep the rest of the piece the way it is because he, he already likes that. So I started to find that, that people were very sensitive just to certain parts of the music. It wasn't necessarily the whole thing. I, I'm saying this for anybody. Can you just raise your hand if you're a composer, if you're interested in doing film music? Okay, so some of you guys, this will mean some, something too. Um, it, it's sort of a different way. It's not sort of. It's entirely a different way of thinking about music than the kind of music that you're learning right now at school. Um, what you're learning at school is really important because it's basically the mechanics of music. It's harmony and theory and orchestration and all that kind of stuff. That's all very, very, very important. But this kind of music, music for films, is a very different kind of music. It's also a very commercial entity. It's a piece of something that is commercial, something that is going to be sold, something that actually has value. 
Now, maybe you, like I, have written a flute sonata or a piano sonata or maybe a symphony or a blah, blah, or whatever it is, you know, something like this. And um, maybe you did it just because you wanted to write one and you never got paid for it. You didn't mind, you wanted to write it and maybe you got it performed and, and it was great. And maybe you had some people show up at the performance more than your mom and, you know, and applaud and that was all, that, all great. Um, maybe you got, maybe you were lucky, maybe you got a commission, maybe somebody paid you $500 or maybe even $5,000 or something like that to pay that thing. That's great, that's even more. To you, it's sort of like icing on the cake because it permitted you to be able to write this kind of music that's very important to you emotionally. I'm not making fun of that. There is that kind of music that certainly to me, there's a lot of music that's very important to me emotionally, that's just for me. This kind of music is not the same thing. This kind of music is a job. And the, the reason I say that is because for all of you, whatever you're interested in, in, in this thing, you, you have to understand, and I, I do mean you have to understand, that this kind of music in the movies, in fact, this kind of entertainment in movies, aside from the fact that it's trying to make you feel sad, it's trying to make you feel happy, they're making a comedy that's gonna make you uh, forget about COVID-19 for two hours, um, they're going to make you a, a scary picture that's going to scare the bejesus out of you for two hours. I mean, all this kind of stuff. It's all entertainment. It's all really fun on some level. But the most important thing is it's making money for somebody. And you're probably paying money somewhere, either in streaming or through your cable carrier or through your theater or whatever it is. You're probably paying money somehow in order to be able to see it. And that money is going directly to the people who made this product. It's a business. In fact, it's called show business. That's not new to you, you know the term, show business. But think of it this way. Show business is a really very elegant term because it talks about two things. It talks about show, which is making something look like something, making people appear a little taller, making people appear a little stronger, more beautiful, more romantic, more scary, more sinister, all these things, that's the show. And then there's the business, which has to do with making money. So if, um, actually, I mentioned this last time I, I talked in this class and, and Rob made a few notes for me. And he actually said something here, which I didn't mean to say, but it's really good. He said, you need to be in the business to be part of the show. That's actually true. If you wanna get, if you wanna get a job in here, you have to be part of the business and you have to learn the business because there are only two words in this term. There's the word show, and there's the word business. There's nothing in between. There's nothing about art. There's nothing about morality or about niceness or about kindness or about fairness. There's nothing about any other thing other than making the show look really great, making people laugh, making people cry, make, making people scared and making money off of it, okay? So if you're really altruistic and it's your highest goal to get into the movies, so that you can write the kind of music or you can make the kind of movies that your favorite film director or, or favorite actors are involved in or your favorite composers are in, that's all to the good. But if you don't recognize the money, you're not gonna be able to survive very long, okay? So you've gotta know something about the, about the um, film business, about the um, commercial, uh, commercial movie business. Um, I mean, here a little bit of a loss of words. Um, and in that, one of the things I, I recommend for all of you, since you're all in, all in school at this point, is that you should, at some point, if you're not already, take a business class. Take a business class. Take something where you learn about economics. Learn a little bit about business, how to make business. Because here's the thing. Unless you work for a major studio, that means unless you work on staff at a major studio and you become the vice president of blah, blah, uh, or the assistant to the vice president of blah, blah, you're probably gonna be working on your own. You may be a member of a union. Uh, you may be part of film production. You may be like a musician. Uh, the musicians have unions. Musicians have unions that, that um, negotiate with the business people, with the people who run the movies, the producers in the studios, the heads of studios for their fees, for how much is fair. If I work for an hour, how much money can I make? And so that it's the union's job to be able to get a, a reasonable living out of it and, and to have reasonable working conditions. Also to provide you with health insurance and, and 
probably a pension, you know, a good pension it provides all those securities that you would get if you were doing a full-time job. Chances are you're not going to have a full-time job. Chances are you're going to be constantly between jobs, which is not the same thing as being out of work. I mean, it is sort of, except that it's being out of work can go on forever. Being between jobs can feel like it's going on be, uh, forever. But if you know enough people and you've got enough experience, chances are you'll just be between jobs. Your TV episode that you've been working, your TV series rather, that you've been working on for five years finally ended. What do you do? You find another TV series. And you find that all the people that worked on that TV series are all out looking for other jobs. And you're going to go along and you're going to work on some of the same shows that those people did too. This is what happened to me. On Gunsmoke, that guy who I talked about who cried and who teared and all that kind of stuff, he ended up doing, uh, the next thing he did was a TV series called How the West Was Won. And so I worked on How the West Was Won for a couple of years. And then after How the West Was Won died, he went on and he became the uh, executive producer of a show over Universal called Buck Rogers, which was in his second season. He didn't create it and he didn't have anything to do with the first season. He came in on the second season. So I went and I worked on Buck Rogers too. So I worked on a lot of shows with a lot of people. Some of the people who worked on Hawaii Five-0 uh, went to work for Dallas. And other people who worked on Dallas went, you know, I mean, it just, it's just like that all the time. We're always working on different jobs with the same people. Um, but you need to have some sort of a business sense so you know what a, um, you, so you know how to make a living um, rather than just have a good time. Um, when, you're, when you're doing this kind of work, particularly as a composer or as a film editor or as a, um, a sound effects person um, or, or generally as a, um, usually as, I think as a union member, uh, you're basically a small business person. You're basically like a small business. And um, a lot of the people are incorporated, which makes them literally a small business. And that makes you entitled to some benefits from the government if you look for them. Um, you can't think of yourself as, as not being a small business just because there's you, but you are the business because you are the producer. You're also the marketing um, wizard in your company. You're the president of your company. Um, you pay the staff, which is you, which means if you have no income, you don't get paid. So you have to figure out how all this stuff is going to work because you are the business. And as, as I say, if you don't take some business courses, which I wish that I had done uh, when I was younger, you're going to be um, at, a, at a serious disadvantage because other people will have taken the business courses and you will be, be making deals all the time, all the time. Every, every time you start to work with somebody who took at least a business course, um, probably somebody who took two or three degrees in that, th that one thing that you wish that you had taken. Um, so anyway, so I, I, going back to how I started, I worked for CBS for 10 years. I eventually became the head of the department. I became the manager of the department, which was not a good idea because I'm not really a good manager. And I wasn't interested in it anyway. I was interested in being a composer. And while I was at CBS, though they didn't pay me uh, as a music supervisor to be a composer, I did start to begin working on TV shows there. Um, when I left CBS, I was fortunate and then I started working right away over at Universal Studios. Um, one of the people in the music staff there had seen some of my work on television and liked it and recommended me. So immediately I got the series on the second uh, on the second season, I got the complete series to Quincy, and I worked on Quincy for four years. Um, Quincy, again, did 24 episodes a year. And of those 24 episodes a year, I would do probably 20 to 22 of them. You know, there were a few that I couldn't do because I get busy. Um, along the line, I picked up other series. I picked up Dallas, and I picked up How the West Was Won, and things like that. And um, so I stayed very busy doing television series for a long time because it's what I knew. It was the, the people that I knew, and, and it gave me a good, uh, really good background on how to work with film and, and um, uh, people and with stories and all that kind of stuff. And I learned what to do with music uh, to be able to use a lot of the stuff that I'd learned at CBS. In the meantime, the CBS music department closed down. Um, when I had joined the CBS music department, they had they, the studios, had just closed down their last orchestras. MGM, I think, was the last orchestra to close. MGM used to have its own orchestra. Universal Studios had its own orchestra. 20th Century Fox had its own orchestra. Warner Brothers, everybody had their own orchestras. They had their own staff people who were there all the time. 
These all closed down and all those musicians went freelance. CBS had an orchestra in uh, New York. They closed that down. So I think the only orchestra that was still around was the NBC orchestra. Um, I'm not sure that's the same group that, I don't know, Rob, do you know, is, was this the same group that was this, the Johnny Carson show? They kept saying it was the NBC orchestra with Don Severinsen. I don't think that was the same thing, was it? No, they, that's what they named the Tonight Show band after they closed the, uh, the actual NBC orchestra down. Okay. So anyway, so that, that was a big change. And then the music department started to change. The music departments used to be run by composers. Um, now they started to get run by business people. Uh, so you were, where at one point you were talking to the director of music, who is a guy who could actually direct music because he was a music director. Now he was the director of a music department, which is not quite the same thing. And he or she, well, at those, those years, it was always a he. Those people didn't entirely understand what you did and frankly didn't care because they were just hiring you to do a job. So let me tell you a little bit what, what they would hire. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but again, just to show you how things had, had changed. When I began working at, um, at CBS, composers were paid a fee that was pretty similar from studio to studio. Um, generally, if you were going to work on a, on a one hour show of Hawaii Five-0 or Gunsmoke or Dallas or anything, depending on whatever the studio was, you would probably make somewhere around $2,000. You might make $2,200 depending upon the studio. Some other places might pay you $1,800, but it was right around $2,000. And for that as the composer, you were expected to write the music, to compose all the music, to um, come in and conduct an orchestra of your choosing, but with the, the uh, studio's budget. In the case of CBS, we had a budget of 18 players and it didn't matter what we chose as players. We could have 18 trumpet players or 18 oboe players we wanted, as long as we could make it sound good. Um, we had 18 players and, um, and then you went home. You were done. You write the music, you come in, you conduct it and you go home. Okay, so in those days, just about every conductor, or just about every composer could conduct. And every composer that I ran into could orchestrate his own music and normally did his own, own orchestration. Sometimes they had orchestrators. And they could do the, the entire thing because they were generally schooled people or they had come out of a background, uh, perhaps of arranging, uh, where they had learned to do all this stuff themselves. So they were really competent musicians. Um, the players were the same thing. A lot of the players, uh, as I say, had come out of the orchestras, the studio orchestras. Some of them had come from other orchestras. Some of them eventually went into other orchestras. We had some players who played in the Philharmonic. Not so many, but you know, occasionally we had people like that. That changed. Um, in this $2,000, uh, there was at that time a composer's union. And $400 of that $2,000 was supposed to be your composing fee. And you would have to pay dues on it to the composer's union. What you were basically getting paid for by the studio was you were getting paid for all your orchestration, what they call arranging, and for your conducting. Those are both things that are, have fees set by the American Federation of Museums, uh, museums of musicians. Yeah, these days they are museums. Um, this is hard to do without an audience response, you know? <laughs> anyway. Um, they I was have, laughing very hard for you, Bruce. Yeah. Um, but there, there's no union for composers now. But at that time, there was. So we would pay, um, we would pay some money to the, the uh, composers union, and we would pay a certain amount of money to the musicians union based on our orchestration and our conducting. And that was basically all out of the $2,000. That was called an all-in budget. That was just a fee. That was how all the composers were, pay, were paid. While I was at CBS, we started to produce motion pictures, big motion pictures. And so we had big composers like, like Jerry Goldsmith and John Williams and Lalo Schifrin and Henry Mancini and people like this. And I got a chance to see their music and you know, learn even more, meet these guys. Even in those cases, people were paid a fee. And I can even tell you what the fees were in those days. There were, there were two lists. There was an A composer list and there was a B composer list. I actually saw the list. There actually was a list. If you were an A composer, you were going to get paid $35,000 to do the music for a motion picture. If you were on the B list, you're going to get paid $25,000. 
And that was basically what it was. So $2,000 for an episode of television, 35,000 or 25,000 for an A or a B composer. So things change. Um, years went by and somebody, actually it was a composer, Mike Post, who decided that he could do better with the money for the um, episode if the studio just gave him the money, the production money, and let him spend the money however he liked on musicians and on composers and let him take care of the music budget. Um, he's sort of proud that he, that he invented this. It was probably not the best idea for everybody else, particularly the ones who weren't business oriented. But all the composers very quickly had to become somewhat more business oriented because that fee structure changed to what is now known as a package. And the, the package has become pretty much the standard way by which everybody, including feature composers, as well as television composers, get paid. In the package, you're still required to compose the music. You're still required to, to orchestrate the scores. You're, if there's an orchestra involved, uh, you're still required to provide a conductor. If you don't want to con conduct, you have to pay for the conductor yourself. If you don't want to do the orchestration, you have to pay for the orchestrator yourself. And by the way, that orchestra, you pay for the orchestra, and you pay for the studio, and you pay for the guy who's, who's engineering the session. That's a lot. Basically, they hand you the, the, the amount of money for the production of one episode of television and say, here, anything left over is yours, but make sure you pay all the bills. Make sure you pay the union stuff, make sure that you pay the non-union stuff, however you're gonna do this thing, and whatever's left over, that's what you get for your music. So this turned into be a bad deal for a lot of composers because a lot of composers weren't used to having to figure out the money. And a lot of composers, frankly, spent all the money on the production. <clears throat> Some composers still do, but composers have gotten wiser and wiser about how to make a little bit of money on this. But a lot of composers, um, I, I wouldn't say that John Williams has probably ever had to work with a package, but Hans Zimmer has. Hans Zimmer knows how to make money of it because Hans Zimmer is a business guy. Um, James Newton Howard has done packages. I mean, everybody's done packages. We've all done packages. We've all learned how to make money out of it. So now you find yourself sometimes negotiating almost directly with, with the musicians that you're working with. Can I afford this person? Can I not afford that person? Can I afford to, to give this person the double? Well, if I give the double, that's gonna be 50% more for that person that maybe I can't afford because I need this instrument over here for that person. You know, so you do all, these, you do all this kind of stuff before you ever put a, a note down to, to paper. Um, so th this whole thing of business and the economy of, of making music is part of the thing that composers now have to be a part of. Um, composers, writers, actors, directors, sometimes producers, um, tend to have attorneys and tend to have agents. Um, agents are supposed to take 10% of your negotiated fee. Most often they take 15%. Um, business managers, I believe, are supposed to take 5% from whatever it is that they do for you. And I couldn't quite tell you the difference between a manager and an agent, except that I believe that managers are not allowed to actually find you work. Agents are, have to do a certification with the state um, in order to, to become an agency. Um, attorneys are a little bit different. Attorneys do not generally work um, on a percentage. Attorney generally works on, a, on an hourly fee. You might be able to make a deal with the attorney and say, well, look, I've only got so much money. Can we do this? Can you be my uh, attorney for $2,500 or blah, blah, blah. Or you can negotiate with your attorney. But the thing about an attorney and the, and the thing about the agents is you have to always ask them, and this is true, whatever kind of attorney you get, always have to ask them, how much do you charge? They won't take it as a rude question. You might feel kind of weird about asking somebody how, how they charge. An attorney expects it. And if you don't ask them, they'll charge you the same anyway. And you're going to get a bill and they'll just say, well, that's my price. And then we apparently agreed on this because you didn't say anything to the contrary. So you have to find out what is your attorney going to charge. So in that, you have to do some research to find out that your attorney, if it's a high spread attorney, it's a high paying attorney, is really worth the money that they're going to spend on you. Because what are they going to do? They're going to look at your contracts. Your agent is going to be the first person who's going to look at the contract. The agent is the person who is going to, we hope, find you the job or at least get you the job. Generally, these jobs come through your own, um, through your own contacts, through people who you know. And the agent then tries to work that into a job for you. If the agent finds out that this producer or this, uh, this director that you've worked with has got a job, 
they'll call up on your behalf. But in the meantime, they're hoping that you will have called the director and you will have called the producer and you've kept your friendship going so that it's an easy sell. It's very unusual for, uh, for an agent to pull something out of a hat. It's happened, I mean, it's happened to me, but um, it's a lot easier to work with things that with, work with people you know. Um, so with, with this agent, they will negotiate the deal, they'll negotiate the price, and they will negotiate many of the terms of the contract, but they won't negotiate it in detail like, um, like an attorney will. So often you're gonna need an attorney. Now you, you can do this without an agent. You can have your attorney do the whole thing. If you can get the job yourself, you can call up an attorney and say, look, I've got this job, I've got this movie to do, or I've got this TV show to do, or I've got this series to do, or a record, or whatever it is. Will you negotiate with me? And the attorney will generally say, yes, my fee is this, or you ask, have to ask them again, what's your fee, what will it charge, and what will you do, and what am I paying for? Am I paying for all the phone calls you're gonna make? Am I paying for every time you send out an email? I mean, some people will charge you for this, some people won't. It's a very specific business deal, again, has nothing to do with art, has nothing to do with anything other than show and the business. And if you get a high spread, a high profile agent or a high profile attorney, so much the better. That's the show part of business. Who's your agent? My agent is boom. You go, wow, that's really important, you know. Or who's your attorney? My attorney is whoa, you know, they've got so and so and they've got so and so and I'm one of their clients, you know. That's a big deal too. It's really kind of silly, but that's what it is. It's all show, it's all show except for the part that's not. And the part that's not is what makes you special. The part that's not is your talent. The part that's not is the, the amount of work that you can bring to it and the amount of enthusiasm and, and the amount of great product that you can put out. But that's primarily, again, between those two words, show and business. It's the kind of thing that will make you last, but it's not enough to make the show. You have to make everybody believe that you're that person. And then you have to try and get the money that shows you are that person that they believe in, right? That's the show business. So your agent and your attorney are both important. They will both take money from you. Um, they will both, like everybody is, everybody will promise how great they will do until you, um, until you actually sign with them and then you'll find out what they can actually do. Uh, people do change agents, they do change attorneys. It's a business and they sort of expect you to go from attorney to attorney to um, agent to agent sometimes. Uh, if you can keep the same one, that's great. Um, okay, so I mentioned <coughs> that the composers have this union. Um, and I mentioned that it's important to have a business sense. Well, composers generally didn't have a good business sense in those days, and they lost their union. Um, the union. The union should have been put together by the National Labor Relations Board. This particular union wasn't. Um, not, all we, not all unions are uh, put together by the NLRB, National Labor Relations Board. Uh, some of them are done by mutual agreement. Um, the Directors Union, for instance, is a, it's a big union, but it's not uh, as solid as something like the, like the Actors Union, the Screen Actors Guild, or like the, um, even like the Writers Union. Uh, it's done through a common agreement that the studios need somebody some entity to be able to negotiate with so they allow this DGA, this Directors Guild to, to survive. I've had a couple of attorneys tell me that they could personally decertify the Directors Guild in about 20 minutes. <clears throat> but the Composers Union was decertified. Actually, it wasn't even decertified because it was never really certified, but they did, they did make contracts. They did negotiate contracts with all the various studios. What the, the reason they lost it was because there was a deal, a long-standing deal, which is still in place, that the composers could not own their own music. So if I get hired to do a TV show or get hired to do a movie, um, basically I sign my rights away for the, for the ownership of that music. I don't own my music. I basically assign it to the studio who has a publisher, and that publisher then is the publisher of my music and can sell it. Um, one of the movies I did, as Rob mentioned, was Silverado. Silverado was done in 1980 something, a long time ago, 30, 40 years ago. Um, that publishing has changed two or three times. Um, it's important for me to know who is publishing that music because if I have any problems with Silverado, uh, I've got to call the publisher and I have to figure out who the publishers are to be able to get the thing done 
that I need to have done on that piece, if in fact it will get done. So the composers work under this thing now called work for hire, but in those days they wanted to own their own music, they wanted to have the say over their own music. Which is a nice idea in theory, except it's a bad idea when you can give it to a composer who doesn't know anything about publishing and doesn't know anything about marketing of music. And most of the, most of the uh, composers who were fighting for this knew nothing at all about this. So what they decided to do, they negotiated for it. The studio said, absolutely not, we won't give it to you. And so what the composer said, okay, we're gonna strike. We're gonna strike and we're gonna sue the studios. How do you like that? So um, the studio said, up to you. So the composer struck. The studios immediately brought in composers from other countries and from other, other towns. It wasn't great. Um, composers went back to work for a while. Oh, by the, by, the, by the way, the Musicians Union, as I say, does not have composers as members. I mean, they have composers as members, but only composers who are working as musicians, which are players, orchestrators, arrangers, things like that, not as composers. <clears throat> so the musicians, the play musicians didn't go on strike while the composers were on strike. The musicians kept working, which was a little awkward. You know, it was really kind of awkward because friends were passing each other on the lines and all that kind of stuff. And the studios, of course, brought out all their old music and re-recorded it. So it was, it was a little murky, it was a little difficult, and, and some friendships got lost and, and a lot of noses got twisted. Make a long story short, the composers were so adamant about getting their own, their own um, rights to their music that they sued the studios. And it actually went to court. Um, and actually the odd thing is that the composers won, sort of. Um, the composers won um, a right for a few months or for a year, I don't remember exactly what the realities were, um, won the right to their own music. There was only one composer who took advantage of it. His name was John Kakavis, who Rob, I think, probably knew. Um, and the only reason he, the, the, the reason he took it was because he had a publishing background. He knew how he could exploit his music, and he did. He had music libraries, and he made money off this thing. No other composer did a thing with their music. And by the way, even though you won, you lost your union because we're not going to negotiate with you anymore, the studio said. So this happened in the 80s. I believe it was the, no, 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 it happened in the 70s. And from that day to this, composers have no union. I've been on two attempts trying to get the composers um, back in unions, and it's, I, I'm pretty much convinced it will never ever happen. So here the composers are, they're out there by themselves, they're all freelance, they're independent contractors, which is what the National Labor Relations Board said to them. Um, that means that, that you cannot, you don't qualify to be a union because you're, you're not supervised, you're independent contractors. And you have to make your own deals. <coughs> so again, I say, you better find out about business. You better find out some things about making deals, find out about agents, find out about um, attorneys and all this other kind of stuff that you know, people need to do. Um, now you're going to be working with people um, who are in a much different state than you. Um, for one thing, you're going to be working for people as a composer, as a whatever you're doing, as a writer, uh, as an editor, uh, you're gonna be writing under supervision. And in a movie or in a television show, um, it can be one of two people. You'll either be writing with, the, you'll either be working with the director or you'll be working with the producer. Chances are, if you're working in, in a television show, you're gonna be working with a producer. And um, I think that in all, in television shows, I don't know about movies, I think in all television shows, the, the producers have been writers and maybe they still continue to write for their show. <clears throat> so you're working with somebody who is creatively similar to you as a composer, but not quite the same thing and also has the additional power of being able to make choice. And by the way, they can also hire and fire you. Uh, if you work in motion pictures, very often it's the director's, director's choice. And some of the things that have changed over the years is Again, going back to the old time in the 60s and the 70s, if you worked with a director on a movie, the director would hire you, the director would interview you for the job and then would tell the producer, I like this person, let's hire that person. And so then the producer would go off and hire it because the producer's job, the producer's job is to come up and take care of all the money. 
is to find the money for the, for the job. So if the producer is going to do it through a studio, then the producer has a deal with the studio. If the producer is going to do it independently, <clears throat> they have to find some way of coming up with all the money. And all the budgeting and all that kind of stuff is the responsibility of the producer. So even the director, who essentially is hired by the producer, the director is working for the producer. They very often work in tandem with each other, and very often the directors partly produce their own movie. But all the people that are chosen, the writers, the actors, the, the grips, the um, lighting guys, all those, they're all hired essentially by the director, but really by the producer, okay? And if there's anybody who's a star in there, it's probably gonna be uh, essentially the director's choice because the director's gonna have a script. The director may have written the script. <coughs> the producer may have brought the script to the director. The director may have brought the script to the producer. You don't know, again, all these friendships happen both ways. Directors and producers try to make friends and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the more people you know, the better off you are, the better chance you have of getting, getting hired. Um, so then they have to, they have to cast it. Um, adding the composer is not the first thing they think of, um, but they definitely have to cast it. So they try to get the big stars. They try to get the name value. Why? Because the big name value will help sell their movie. It's the show, right? It's the show. Hey, we've got um, Matt LeBlanc. Okay, how big is he? Well, uh, for this kind of a movie, he's pretty big. So let's see if we can get Matt LeBlanc. Why? Because of the business. We want it to make a lot of money. Okay, so Matt's not available. Who do we get? <clears throat> so we start thinking about everything. Okay, Matt's not available, so we're going to get blah, blah, blah. And pretty soon you get somebody else. Not the person you really wanted, but the best person you can get. So already you started to qualify your movie. And it goes through the whole thing like that. You want the best lighting person. You want the best cinematographer. Well, that person isn't available. Um, you're not able to pay the person what they really want. So you're going to get the other person. And the other person may be better than the person you wanted, but won't be as famous. So the show bit is mm, not so good, you know, and unless they be becomes a star later and you're, you know, it's all up and down. But the business part is really important because maybe you save some money on this guy that you didn't want. And it goes that way all through to the composer. So they get down to the composer and they say, who would we like? Well, let's get John Williams. Well, we can't afford John Williams. Um, those days, by the way, of $35,000 for movies, they're gone. Um, I don't remember the last time. I, I don't know how much these guys make, but I don't remember. I think the, probably the last time John Williams made $35,000 for a movie was way before your parents got married, a long time ago, okay? Um, because those fees have started to go up and up and up and up and up. One of the reasons those fees started to go up and it went up for everybody was because the studios, I told you the CBS um, doesn't have a music department anymore. Neither does NBC, neither does Universal. Well, Universal, no, Universal really doesn't either. Um, Universal doesn't record shows like they used to. <clears throat> they do these uh, things that I mentioned, um, these packages. So they did, they'll call the composer and say, would you like to work in our series? Yes. Okay. Here's the money. And you give us the show. It's, it's like that. So they don't need the music departments like they used to have. They used to have big departments of music copyists and they used to have musicians and music contractors on that's all gone. So what happened is now everybody has become an independent contractor. So the prices have gone up and the agents now have more to do with the price of what you're going to get for a TV show or for a movie than any standard that used to exist a long time ago. So the agent's gonna do it on what? He's gonna do it on your show. How much is this guy worth? What was the last movie he or she did? Oh man, that's a big movie, I wanna have that. Well, the last three movies this guy did didn't do very well. And you know what? I'm a little bit worried about that because maybe it was the fault of the composer. So let's not hire that guy, you know, cause you don't want this business thing to go down too. So are, are they, um, are they a little bit superstitious? Yeah, they're real superstitious. They like stars because stars mean to them. That show means money. It's all the stuff in the middle, see, that we're concerned about, but they're not thinking about that. They're thinking about your star value and they're thinking about this. So John Williams, okay, we'd like to have John Williams, but you know, we can't afford John Williams. So who are we gonna get next? Well, I like Hans Zimmer. Well, Hans Zimmer, <coughs> he probably makes the same kind of money as John Williams. Okay, so not Hans. So they go down through and they don't go down through and then they get, Joe, whoever it is. Uh, but he had a very nice movie that uh, it made some money. So, uh, and he doesn't cost too much and we can afford him, you know? So that's how I do it. So that goes all the way through the production of, of TV shows and, and movies and everything else. They, 
try to get the best people they can. Sometimes they do, but sometimes other things like their fame or their price or their availability kicks in, so then you have to have a second choice. Um, same, th same thing with musicians, by the way. You know, you're trying to put together, the, the composer <clears throat> generally gets the choice <clears throat> of who he wants, who he or she wants to play in the orchestra, and they call for somebody and so-and-so isn't available. So it has nothing to do with anything. In that particular thing, the, the wages are determined by a union, so you don't have to do the star value. Uh, you know how they play, so you want so-and-so to play. They're not available. So you hope that you know enough players who can play well enough, even though the person you really want isn't there. Or you may have to call the person you really want and see if you can make a special deal and have them turn and get out of something else. You, know, you have to do all that kind of stuff. What I'm trying to say here is, is increasingly upon you, the individual, to be able to work your way through this minefield of commercial work. Because again, commercial work means that somebody's making money out of it and you want to be one of those people. So you want to, you want to uh, make your, um, uh, your career important enough for people to recognize who you are, the show value, and you want to make it important enough so that people will pay you what they should be, be paying you for that stature that everybody believes you have, right? You want to make a living. You don't want to do it as an art. It's not an art form, um, at least not when you're working in it. So the director is the creative head of the film. <clears throat> you come into it as the composer. And I, again, I don't know. I know there are three or four composers here. I don't know what the rest of you do, but just turn this in. When I say composer, just turn it into whatever the thing is that the German should do it. Um, it's the composer's, in, in, the, in the movies, it's the composer's vision that, and I use the word in quotes, the composer's vision that we're most interested in. Uh, in television, if the producer is in charge, if it's the executive producer in charge, then it's his or her vision that you have to be, be really paying attention to. Because the only reason they're asking you to be a part of this film, and this matters entirely whether you're an actor or whether you're a composer, whether you're a French horn player, whether you're the guy pulling wire on the, on the um, production stage, the only reason that they want you there is so that you can do something good for their story, period. Meaning the lighting guy, if you can light the scenes so that we can really believe that the story is taking place here and not here, you know, even though you're shooting it in your garage, can we make it look like Versailles? Yeah, can you do that? Yeah, yeah, sure. I can. Okay, there you do it. So you do it with cardboard thing, you know, and it looks like Versailles. Well, that's great. But that because you're trying to do it for this person who has hired you to be able to attain their vision. Okay, it has nothing to do with your vision. It has a lot to do with your technique. It has a lot to do with your ability to deliver. And it has a really a lot to do with you being able to understand somebody else who is trying to tell you something that sometimes sounds really very ephemeral. It does not sound too realistic. Most people don't know very much about music. So as a composer, you're gonna get people who are gonna say, I want it to sound, you know, kind of greenish, you know, I'm kind of, you know, I don't like that blue, I, I want, that means nothing at all to you. So you have to take into the account of the, what, what the person is saying to you and who that person is and what they mean. Do they really mean what they say? Are they trying to pretend as though they're, they're more, um, qualified in your field than they truly are. And I'll tell you, most directors and producers are not very qualified in music. They really are not. Uh, they don't have to be. They, they know what they like, and they know what they like when they hear it and when they get it. So your thing is to play to that. Your thing is, if they need to have the actor look really grimy every time he shows up on, on the screen or she shows up on the screen, that's your job with your music, however you're going to do that. How you do that is your technique and, and your own particular talent, your own ability. <clears throat> but your need to do that is entirely the directors or the producers. So as I say, for you composers who have been learning about um, technique, been learning about chords and learning about harmony and counterpoint and structure and how to play an instrument and how to play a line and how to write a line, all that kind of stuff, this is not exactly the same thing as what you've been learning. How do you make a director feel, or an audience feel, or a producer feel, or a studio executive who might stand above all these guys because he or she may have all the money that they need? How do you make any of them feel like this movie is happy enough, that it's a funny enough movie, or that it's scary enough, or that it's anything enough, you know? 
you have to do that with your music. So you write this piece of music and like my producer friend, they start to cry, nailed it. You nailed it, right? Or like my producer friends does not start to cry. Problem, you got a problem. And this time you can't just go upstairs and find another piece of music. You got to write another piece of music. And then you have to listen to instruction from this person as to why that music doesn't work for them. You could have the whole building full of musicians and um, sightseers in tears. But if the director is not one of them, you may have to rewrite it. Have I ever had to rewrite music? Yeah, you bet. Everybody does. Everybody gets out of the, every composer, and I mean every composer, there no qualifications at all. Every, and Rob knows this. Um, Rob's been there as they've done it. Every composer's had to stand up there and for some reason or another had to change what they wrote. Either they take the trumpets out or they put the horns in or they take the violins down an octave or they put them up an octave or, or do something like that or they wait for another player to come in they take another player. I mean, they do all these sorts of things to be able to make the director or the producer achieve their vision, okay? It's really important. So you are ancillary. You are a very necessary part of it. They cannot make, in, in composers, this will make you feel good, okay? They cannot make a movie without you. That doesn't mean that they want to hear your music. They actually don't care about your music. They care about their film. And the only reason they have music in the film is because the thing that you do has a certain kind of magical effect on people. It has a certain emotional effect. It makes them feel something. There's not one person in 10,000 or maybe in 100,000 who when they go into a theater and they listen to, if, if they're actually listening to the music, knows anything at all about how the music is being produced or, or who the person was who wrote it and all that kind of stuff. They don't care, they're just going there to be entertained. So your job is to make everybody in the theater, everybody whoever watches, the, or at least as many people as possible, whoever watched your film from now until the sun you know, becomes a red dwarf, um, to make them all laugh at the same jokes or make them frightened and all that kind of stuff. This is the stuff that music does. It isn't the beautiful thing. They're not going to ever, ever say to you, you know, I love the way you use the saxophones there. That was just, you know, so delicate and so they don't care. They might know something about a saxophone. They'll say, I like the way the saxophone sounded. It sounded like a dog barking. I thought that was really cool. You go, oh, thanks. And you're inside, you're thinking, wonder what he's talking about. I don't know what they're talking about. I don't know where the dog's, dog's barking. I've had a... Um, I've had a director actually say to me, and I've had, I've had directors be absolutely thrilled, want to have my baby and everything. I mean, I've, I've had a lot of big successes on, on a lot of recordings I've done. That's great. That's when everything work, works fine. That's when they love you and they want to work with you forever and ever. That, that's great. That happens. But sometimes it doesn't happen. And even sometimes it happens with people who you formerly have had a good experience with. It's a little bit like dating. The first date was a little rocky. The second date was really hopeful. The third date, you're probably not ever going to see this person again. You know, it happens. So I've had cases where the director actually said to me, I don't want this. I don't want this in my film. I don't like what you're doing. I don't want any of it in my film. So then they've got a choice. They can either get rid of you and get somebody else, which is usually the, the choice they go to, or they can persist and make you change everything until you do it the way they want it. Now that happened to me once. It only happened to me once. And it was with a guy that I worked for. And in this thing, I have to take responsibility for it. In fact, I would advise all of you that whatever happens bad in your life, whatever it is, and now we're not talking about music and films, whatever it is, take responsibility for it. It makes it so much easier to figure out and to correct. Anyway, so I decided I had to take responsibility for it. I had worked with him once before. What I knew about this guy was that he's very smart. He's very articulate. And he's very serious about the movies that he makes. He's a good director, he's a good cinematographer, he's a good writer, he knows about all these things. He had even been a musician, he, could, he was a drummer, so he couldn't read pitches, but he could read rhythms. So he knew, something about, he knew something about music, he could talk about an eighth note or a quarter note or something like that. And when he told me what he wanted, he said, I told you what I wanted. I wanted you to do blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, blah, and then he repeated exactly what, in fact, he had told me like two months earlier. What I had done is I had made the stupid error of thinking that he really didn't know what he, what he really wanted. I, would, I made the, the, the big error that I translated for him because I understood this guy based on my experience with him before. Well, it turned out that he wasn't that crazy about the movie we'd worked on before, what I had done, but he didn't tell me that, 
Okay, but that was still my job to figure that out. So what did I do? I rewrote. I rewrote the score. I spent a lot of time on the stage with musicians, changing the score, taking out music, putting things in, making things easier, making things simpler, taking it, putting it in spaces. I did all the things that I could do to make him happy. Now he was unusual because he held my feet to the fire and he made me change everything. And I was able to change it and make him happy. And then we worked together again after that. So it, it wasn't like one of these finite things where you know you really screwed up your career, but it could have. As I say, the most important thing that I learned from that is you can't treat everybody the same. Sometimes they say, I want this and this and this and this. And they may mean that exactly. And sometimes they really don't because they really, they, they trust you. They don't know, you know, that much about music and they're trying not to appear stupid. They know a lot about lighting. They know a lot about writing because they study this stuff in school. They don't study much about music in school. But it's their vision, again, that you, that you have to um, pay, pay attention to. Um, <coughs> the way you get hired on these jobs is either through a contact that you make on your own, like your sister's boyfriend is producing a film, um, and you get to know the boyfriend through your sister and they get, you know, you go out and have a couple of pizzas together and you tell them you're a composer and next thing you know, you got a film. That happens. It doesn't happen a lot, but it happens. Um, or you meet somebody at a screening, like maybe you go to a screening of a new film and somehow you're in there and the guy you're talking to or the woman you're talking to next is a film editor. Maybe she edited this film. Maybe she didn't. Maybe she's a friend of the film editor. And she's looking for something else to go. But so you make friends with this person. And this person who is this film editor, which means nothing to you, is really good friends with a couple of people who are directors who want to make films. Because he, she, film editor, is the person that the director most needs in order to make their vision come true on the screen. So if you make friends with this film editor, your chances have just increased of being able to work on a film. Because if you can become friends, if you can really make friendships, and he or she will show you some of the work that they've done, and you can show them some of the work you've done, so that they can become your agent to their director friend. That happens. That actually happens a lot. Um, so the more people you know who are in this kind of work that you want to do, the more your chances are being increased of doing this kind of work. It doesn't make any sense at all to want to be a film composer or, or to want to be able to write movie scripts or to be able to want to produce movies and then take a job as a construction worker in um, Detroit working on, um, I don't know, apartments for the elderly. Makes no sense. And it doesn't even make any sense to you. But there are a lot of people who actually do their careers that way. They say, I have a goal that I want to do this. And then they, act, and then they walk in completely the wrong direction. If you want to be a composer, you have to you have to be around the people that composers are around. Not necessarily other composers. You don't need to be around other composers, but you need to be around people who need composers. You need to find some way of making filmmakers your friends. You need to find out who the people are who are friends of the filmmakers. You want to make them your friends. And you know what? You will make friends. When I was in school, I went to USC and I took a uh, I took a class that happened every Thursday night. It was a four hour class. We used to call it Thursday night at the movies because it was led by a, a well-known film critic. And he would show a movie, he would show a brand new movie before it got released. And then um, that would take a couple hours. And then he'd bring somebody down from the studio who had worked on the movie. Sometimes it was the composer, very often it was the director. Sometimes it was a guy from the union, you know, it was all sorts of people and they would talk about the movie. So this one night, I don't remember what the movie was. Uh, they had a guy come down who was from the union and he looked kind of tough you know he wore a suit but he looked kind of tough and um one of the he was taking questions afterwards and one of the kids in the class the football guy um i'm saying that because we we all took this class because it was an easy credit so whether you're a football pro or a piano player like me that it was a good class to take and so he asked this guy mr so-and-so is it true that in hollywood it's not what you know but who you know and I thought to myself, wow, what a rude question. Well, you know, that's such a terrible thing. It's not what you know, it's who you know. The guy didn't flinch. He looked at the kid and he said, look, in life you have friends. You like your friends. Your friends like you. You like to do nice things for your friends because you like them. Your friends are going to do nice things for you because they like you. 
So go out and make a lot of friends. That's even better than, than learning how to play golf, hoping that you might have to date, or fearing that you might have to date the producer's daughter. Go out and make a lot of friends, but be smart. Make friends who are in the same business as you're trying to get into. I mean, to make friends just for the sake of making friends, that, that's great. If you have a lot of friends, nobody can have too many friends. But in terms of the business, part of the business is you want to find people who are interested in what you do. You want to find people who are interested in doing the kinds of things that you want to get involved with. It only makes sense, right? Uh, you'd be surprised, and I mean truly surprised, how many people don't know that. Um, I've had, over the years, I've had many people ask me how to get into the business. And the answer, of course, we all know now is make lots of friends. Find somebody who will hire you. That's, that's how you get in the business. But I've had um, young composers ask me for years, do you think it'd be a good idea if, if I became a copyist, if I became a music copyist, that is writing out the notes for the musicians to play? And I said, well, you know, that's a good job. It's a good paying job. Um, if you don't want to do it, uh, the thing is you might get busy doing it. You might be good at it and you're going to get busy at it. And then you're going to make so much money, you're not going to be able to give it up and look for those things that you'd like to write music for. So maybe you don't want to do that. And I would suggest, why don't you just stand in the line for composers rather than the line for copyists, unless you want to be a copyist. Both lines are hard. Both lines are difficult to get into. It's not, you can't just start becoming a music copyist. You can't just start becoming a composer. There's a lot of stuff you have to go through. So why don't you pick the line you're going to go into? And I say that to all of you. Pick the line you want to go into and then see what's involved to get to the, to the front of that line. Um, okay, so I said the producer is the one who finances the film. And the question the producer wants to know is, and, and these days it's not so much the producer, and it is the producer, but it's more and more the studio. Um, one of the things that's changed over the last 40 or 50 years has been <coughs> that the control uh, has been more and more taken away from the directors. The creative control has been taken more away from the, the directors. The directors and the producers were very often a very tight um, association, sometimes a friendship. I knew guys who were partners um, for years. Uh, one was the producer and the other was the director. They made a lot of great films together until they finally went, went their own ways. And they're, they're still friends. Um, but more and more you'll find the studios are gonna be the ones who are calling the shots. And the problem with that is that these aren't guys who have ever made movies before. If they, if they had been movie makers, they would still be making movies because they, be they would be creative people. In the studio, they are creative, but they're not creative in the way that you are going to be when you're involved in making a movie, whether you're a composer, a writer, or whatever you are. These are guys who, they're bean counters, you know. I mean, they're, they're, they know how much that last movie made, and they know the profits on this one, and they, they have a pretty good idea of what this one is going to make, they think, you know, and this one. Oh, how do you look? That, that one we thought was going to be a dud. That became famous. Oh, great. Well, I'm going to take responsibility. You know, there's all this sort of stuff. They're not the same as directors and producers, but they do have a lot to say in whether you get hired or not, believe it or not. <clears throat> it's true. I mean, certainly of composers. Um, but the questions that, that they're going to ask, whether it's the studio or whether it's the producer, and I've, I've talked about this just a few minutes ago. Can we afford this person? We have a music budget. And in this music budget, let's say we have, uh, pick a figure out of the sky. We have, um, we have $500,000 in our music budget. $500,000 means we have to find a composer. We have to find um, enough money for the music to be produced. We'd really like to have an orchestra. We do, we'd like not to have this to be an electronic. We, we want to have an orchestra. Uh, that means we've got to find a place to record it. And, um, and if we're really smart, we know that we've got to have the music preparation, meaning we have to hire a whole bunch of copyists and orchestrators. And we have this whole team of people that we have to pay for. Um, so how much does the composer cost? <clears throat> $500,000? Well, that's my entire music budget, so we're not going to do that. And besides that, what's in the music budget? Well, the music budget is all the things I just talked about for the, for the uh, score and for the composer, but it also involves things like music licensing. How many times have you gone to a movie, like a zillion times, gone to a movie and heard a song that you knew that was playing in the background? You go, oh yeah, I know that song. And what it's, the reason it's there is because it's trying to set a certain kind of a mood for you. It might be saying, this movie took place in 1988. When this, this, this is a disco movie, and there's that disco song. Remember that? This is really the rage in 1980, blah, blah, whatever it was. 
uh, or it might be um, the theme song from another movie and go, oh, I remember that movie and this playing in this movie. Okay, how did that happen? Somebody had to pay for it because all the music, the music that you're writing, the music that has been written by everybody who before you, dead or alive, um, is owned by somebody, it's owned by these publishers. And before you can use any music in a film, you have to pay for it. So they're gonna pay for you as a composer to write new music and they'll make a deal with you, there'll be a contract. And then if they need five songs, they're probably gonna hire a music supervisor who's gonna be expensive, who's gonna make, the, who's gonna find the songs that they can afford. And by the way, this $500,000 music budget that sounds so much, sounds so, so big, uh, about $260,000 of it is gonna to go to songs. So your music budget of $550,000, <coughs> composer, just got down to $240,000. That happens all the time. Very often in a lot of these movies with huge budgets for, for uh, music, the, mu the budget for songs is a lot higher than it is for the original music, believe it or not. Um, $500,000 uh, is a lot of money. Um, it's not a lot of money for a lot of big movies. It's a lot of money for a lot of other movies, though. And um, it's not that every, every movie even has a budget like that. A lot of movies will have budgets like $35,000 or $40,000 or $15,000. Um, and for that, that's a package. Again, you have to process the whole thing and make some money on your own. You've got to make, do it as a living and find out how you're going to make money on that and produce the music at the same time. Um, so who can we afford? And then when they figure that, who can we afford? Um, some names, particularly if they, if they can't afford the high price spread, we get down to the lower price spread. Uh, okay, I don't know that person. What have they done? So that's, if you've got an agent, this is when your agent's supposed to be good for you. Your agent's supposed to say, well, you know, they just did this happening thing and they were in the Sundance Festival and they, they did this and that and they did this and that. And I'm going to send you some music. I'm going to send you some... Uh, I'm going to send you some scenes of this person because this is somebody's not, you know, the agent's going to try and sell you at that point. If you don't have an agent, then you have to sell yourself. It's harder. You should try to have somebody else negotiate for you. To have to negotiate as a creative person is really, really difficult. You are at a disadvantage because you don't know how much you're worth. Um, I was talking to a couple of um, people, a couple of composers a couple of weeks ago who were trying to get a job. It was a low budget job. They were just out of school. They've been out of school maybe six, seven months. I think they graduated last year. And uh, it was a job that there wasn't much money in, <clears throat> but we didn't know how much money there was. Um, so we were talking about what they might be able to do in trying to get this job. And I said, how much money are you gonna try and ask for? And they said, well, we thought, after thinking about it, we thought $20,000. We're gonna do it on synthesizers. So, and it's gonna take us a couple of months. So we thought, there's two of us, so we thought we would ask for $20,000. I said, how'd you come up with that figure? Well, um, we just sort of thought, we just sort of thought it was a good figure, that it wasn't that much, but it was something, you know? And um, I said, have you talked to anybody else about it? And he said, no. And I said, well, why don't you talk to some other composers about it? Because everybody's been through that thing where they've got a low budget thing and they have to come up with a figure. So they did, they came up, they, they talked to some other composers about it. And the information they got back from a lot of the composers was, well, we think that's really high, you know, because $30,000 is really high, you know, and, um, they talked to other people and said, well, you know, and I, I said one thing to them that I thought was important. I said, be sure that whatever the figure is, that it's something that you can live with because you don't want to be up, up to your eyebrows in music and problems and find out that you're working for something that's not worth it to you. So make sure you get something for yourself. So they talked about it. They talked about it between themselves. They talked about it with other composers. Some composers thought it was high. Some composers thought it was this or that. And they give them that. So I talked to them about a week later and I said, What's happening on your project? Oh, so we got the project. I said, well, congratulations. That's very exciting. So how much money are you getting? He says, well, we're getting $25,000. I said, great. So you were able to give yourself a raise. So they had to do it on themselves. 
they had no way, I mean, they were really at a disadvantage. They had no way of knowing, and I couldn't help them, <clears throat> nobody could actually help them, of knowing how much they were worth. In fact, for both these people, this is their first job. This is their first commercial job. So it's really important for them to get it. Would they do it for nothing? Yeah, they'd do it for nothing. Would they pay the producer to do it? Probably. I don't know that that's stupid, but there have been people who have done that. Um, so did they do well? Yeah, they did very well. Will they do okay on this project? Yeah, they'll probably do it really good on, on this project. So what are they gonna have when they're gonna be done? They're gonna have, they're gonna have a credit, which is really, really important. They're gonna have a few friends that they've just made. They're gonna make friends with this music supervisor who's a really decent guy. Um, they're gonna have some money because they're not into a lifestyle situation yet where they're, they're driving uh, Jaguars and Mercedes and things like that, you know. Uh, they're not living up in the Hollywood Hills yet. Um, so, I mean, they're going to do pretty well by themselves. So as a first job, I'd say these people did pretty well. If they're doing the same thing in 10 years, maybe they're not doing so well. If they don't get any other jobs, when the question comes to the producer, to the studio, what has this person done? Well, 10 years ago, they did this low budget thing for a Bananarama ride, you know, out in East, whatever it was. You know. um, that's not going to mean an awful lot. So you've got to keep your... You've got to keep your credits current if you want to try to stay in the business. As I say, the, the uh, studio, people who you will not interview with um, will have a lot of things to say about your hiring. Um, I'm not sure, did, did I say, did you have to go through an interview with the director? I'm not, did I, let me, let me, let me just mention it. Um, one of the things that they will do, that the director will do before they hire you, is you'll actually have an interview. You'll have a face-to-face -face -to -face interview. The, the, um, the director or the producer, or whoever's doing this, will know your credits. They'll have it before them. Uh, they will know what you earned on your last project. Believe it or not, you will think that, that that had been a secret, but it's not. It's really well known to everybody. The studio who's gonna hire you, if it is a studio, is gonna know all this stuff as well. They're gonna know the people who hired you. They're gonna call them up and say, what's this person like? Are they any good? What were they like with you? Were they easy to work with? What kind of music did they do? what was good, what was bad, all this stuff is going to be checked out before you get the interview. <clears throat> and you're not going to be the only person they interview. Um, they're going to have other people. And in this, the one thing that you probably won't notice about them is that, the one thing that you probably will notice, rather, about yourself is that you're fairly anxious about this interview, just like the, my friends that I was talking about. They were pretty anxious about it. They were pretty anxious about getting the right price. They were really hopeful they were going to get this first job, you know, they had a lot of anxiety. But on the other side, what they didn't see that the other side was anxious too, because the other side didn't want to have to end up, end up dealing with agents and dealing with people who are going to negotiate for more money than they have. So we hope that everybody got lucky here that it was a win-win. I, th I think these people will do a really good job and I think that the client will be happy and it'll be a great opportunity for a second job. But the thing is, as you're negotiating with these people, or not negotiating, as you're interviewing with these people, they're nervous. They're really nervous. They're saying, well, what if I choose you? Are you going to screw up my movie? Like that story I just told you a few minutes ago about the, about the director who said you screwed up my movie. <laughs> you know, are they going to give you a chance to do that? No, they don't want to do that. Um, are they going to want to have you do the movie and find out that it didn't work and they're going to fire you and then they're going to have to hire another composer that they don't have a budget for and they're going to go through the whole rigmarole again, get another you know, music budget. And yeah, they don't want to do that. Are you the right person for my movie? Um, after I did, Silver, when I did the movie Silverado, whether you've ever seen it or whether you haven't, um, it was the first big, I had done two little movies before that, which nobody saw. Um, Silverado was the first big movie I did with a big studio. Before that, I had done 15, 20 years full of television. I'd done a lot of television. Television doesn't transfer necessarily to movies. If you're good in television, that doesn't mean you're going to get a movie career. They, they don't necessarily cross over. So when I had the interview with Silverado, <coughs> the thing I have to say that, that actually happened is the director and I hit it off. He was the writer of the, of the script. I had read the script. He and his brother had, had written it. The interview was with the two of them, along with the music editor, who was a former musician, which didn't hurt. Um, and what did we talk about? We just talked about their script. We talked about their vision. Um, I talked a little bit about how I saw the script. It turned out to be the way that they saw the script, so I got lucky. On the next movie, 
The next movie was, that I did was called Young Sherlock Holmes, completely different. It was uh, something that Steven Spielberg was the executive producer on. Uh, a young director, Barry Levinson, this was his third film. Uh, he had been a writer. Um, the two films he had done before uh, had been successful. One was very hot called Diner. Um, this was something completely new. It was sort of like in the, um, uh, well, it was, it was a very Spielberg kind of a movie. It had a, um, it was, it was a lot, a lot of, it actually was a good movie, whatever it was, but it was very different from Silverado, very different, different style and everything. So we went out to lunch together. This was my interview. And um, again, he's trying to learn me. I'm trying to learn him. And you can see that he was really, he was struggling with this. I mean, is this the right guy? I mean, I know he did a, he did this cool job on Silverado because that was the rap that was going on. And I said, well, look, why don't you, why don't you call the director of Silverado and just ask him what he thinks? He said, well, I've already done that. <laughs> he said, we knew each other. He said, we have offices down, down the hall from each other. He said, no, I talked to him a long time ago. I've already done that. These guys will have done all their homework. These people will have done all their homework when they, when they get you, no matter whether the budget is high or whether it's small. And if they haven't, you're going to have to do it for them. Um, that's basically what I have to say. Um, the, the, the takeaway points that I think I, I would like to have with you is that in this, it's, I, I think if you can hold on to that idea of show business being not just entertainment. Entertainment is a part of it, it's the show part. In the show part is also how people think of you and how you want people to, th to think of you, how you want people to think of you. There are some people who are very good at looking um, very important and very genius, like very creative and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, we know right now that there are some directors who are very, very, very famous. Steven Spielberg is probably the most famous director, but there are other guys and, and like Alfred Hitchcock, famous, famous stuff. But there was a shtick that he had to make people think that he was really the guy, you know? And so there's that entertainment part and there's that show part, but the business part is really, really, really important. Um, in between, I say the show and the business, there's technology, there's you, there's your talent, there's your ability. One of the things that I didn't, that I didn't say here, and it probably isn't necessary, but maybe it is, is that when I began working over 50 years ago, there are a lot of things that you take for granted that haven't been invented yet. For instance, if we had had a COVID uh, outbreak, a pandemic then, we would not be doing this in 1967 because this had not been invented yet, meaning this computer stuff. Um, we wouldn't be immediately, as soon as this class is finished, if you haven't been doing it while I've been talking, we wouldn't be hitting one of these things to see what was really interesting, you know, that was on here. Um, all these things have changed and the way, the way movies are made have been changed. The way movies are recorded has changed enormously. It used to be that we worked on film. You've all heard it, it's the film business, right? When was the last time any of you ever saw a piece of film? <coughs> I haven't seen a piece of film for years. It's not done on film that much anymore. It's done on computers. Uh, it used to be that before I could look at a movie to decide where the music was going to go with the director or the producer, we would actually go into a little theater that was on the lot of the, of the studio and we would sit there in the theater and a projectionist would run the film for us. He would actually run film, you know, it had little holes, little sprocket holes and we knew how many composers had to know how many sprocket holes there were in a, each frame of film because we used to time by that stuff. That doesn't exist anymore. Or if it does, it's not used very often. Um, now we're doing things, I may not meet the director except this way. Uh, we may look at the film together. He'll be in his home and I'll be in my home and we will just call it up on the computer and we're gonna go through the film together and we can talk to each other and whatever other way we do it. I mean, technology has changed all this. And the way that they've made movies have changed that it has a big impact on the way you're gonna put music into it or the way you're gonna put sound effects into it or the way that you're either, even gonna act out your scene. Because what it used to be when they had film, film was a was a, a, a piece of plastic basically um, that could be carried. It was on reels. I mean, you know, you you've all seen movie reels. It was they held generally a thousand feet of film, which is about ten minutes worth of, of program. And if you wanted to make a change in the film, you had to take this film out and run down to the spot where the change was and actually cut it 
and then tie it to another, or rather paste it to another piece of film that you also had to run to and find. Well, you don't do that anymore. Now you sit at a, at a editing desk or your computer and go click, 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 click. The scenes are together, you paste that, you paste that. I mean, you probably do it yourself for your own, your own demos before you put them onto um, Instagram or something. You know, you can all do that. A lot of people can do this. Um, what does that mean for your music? Well, and how has it changed music? Well, when I began, you could write these pieces of music with long melodies and long, beautiful harmonies and big orchestrations. You could have choirs and all this kind of stuff. Because when they finished with the scene, they were finished with the scene. It, it was so laborious to go through all the film and make all these changes. They had to figure out what they wanted and they had to end so that they could give it to the music guys and they could give it to the sound effect guys so that they could give it to the looping guys so the actors could all do their lines so that it could be properly recorded and all that. They had all that stuff to be able to, to do and they had, because they were dealing with physical product, they had to do it slowly and completely for, to an end. Now they don't have to do it. So the last day of dubbing, the last day when they're putting all the soundtracks together, what they can do, and they do it, you will hear this conversation between the director and the editor. You know that scene? That scene that we used to have in front of this thing? I think we ought to put it back because she says something that doesn't make sense unless that scene's there. And the editor says, oh, okay. So it used to be that the editor would have to go back to the studio, would have to get the film, take the film off the rack, go back to his room and run it down and get that and then paste it all together. We'd have to sit around. We'd actually sit around for 45 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half, waiting for this to be done. Not anymore. The director's are on his editing bay and just says, like that, and it's all ready. So what does this do with the music? Well, we had music in there. <clears throat> well, okay, so you have to take the music out and you need a piece for the beginning too. Well, how are we gonna do that? Well, so you have a music editor who, who's sitting there also on a computer with Pro Tools with all the music tracks trying to figure out how we can get this piece from that piece connected to this piece from that. You know, it's all very, very different. This is one of the reasons why the music itself has changed uh, so dramatically in style. People make fun of Hans Zimmer sometimes because Hans has this um, sort of one chord style. Well, you know, one chords works really great. A one chord style works really great when you have to make a lot of edits in it because you're, you're just changing from A minor to A minor, meaning you're changing from here to here. The old days, you'd have to change from here to here. Not so easy, you know, and the trumpets suddenly become clarinets. Not a good idea. So the, the style of music and the kind of people who can write it have changed. The more opportunities. So the people, as these instruments have become invented that allow everybody to be a composer, a lot of composers have no sense of technique. They have no sense of harmony or, or of um, anything other than the kind of stuff that they can manipulate on these keyboards. They may not even be able to read music. That's not unusual at all anymore. So the whole thing has changed. And that's one of the things I, 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 I want to give you as a takeaway. It's a business. Your career is important and how people see you is important. So the projects you get are important. Um, but what's also important is that things will change. There is nothing that you're working on now. If you should all leave school tomorrow and all get jobs on Monday, you know, which will be very, very exciting. And we hope that they'll all be paid, well paid jobs. The whole technique and everything will change by this time next year. There will be changes in it. The way you're getting paid will probably change. Um, the people who you've been working for, they may change too. Um, but the technique definitely will change. And the things that you, that you learned and the things that you know now and that you're really good at now aren't gonna be so interesting in a year. And in 10 years, nobody's gonna remember. You're gonna be talking to a class like this and, and the kids are gonna be saying, I don't even know what you're talking about. I, maybe a few of you today haven't been knowing what I was talking about. You know, that's what you go through. Um, but uh, it's, I, I can say that the good thing is, if it's a business that you want to be in, um, if it's the kind of thing that you like, working with lots of people in different conditions, working on different projects that are always different, of coming up with things that you can never, ever, ever figure out that you are going to be working on, in my case, writing music that I never thought in my, in my life as a, as a student that I would ever work on, to work with people uh, who are so talented, 
uh, and not all of them, some of them are not, not so talented, but there are a lot of people who are really talented, some people who are more talented than you. Um, it's, it's really exciting, it's really very cool. It's a, it's a great way to earn a living. If you don't like it, if you don't like the stress and you don't like working with people and you have a hard time, you know, making friends, all that kind of stuff, it may not be for may not be too good for you because there's a lot of people in it. Um, I would say about 90% of your job is probably psychology, you know, and maybe 1% is the thing that you learned in school that's so precious. So uh, Rob, I think that's, you know, unless there's something else, another pearl I can drop. I, I think that's a ton of information. And uh, I took four pages of notes. <laughs> so uh, anyway, wow. Uh, Bruce, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, it's just spectacular hearing you hearing you talk about the things you know about that. Those of us who sit on the other on the other side of the who don't go into the control booth have never gotten to see. Um, so, thank uh, just thank you. Uh, well, thank you. I, I, I have one. I have two questions. Okay. One is, if they, how does copyright work? if you've written a part of the score and they throw it out and hire a different comp composer, are you still, do you have anything to do with the copyright on the film at that point or are you just gone? You, you give it away. Um, in your, in the copyright law, there's something called work for hire. Yeah. Oh, which okay. I, okay. Which I think was brought in in the seventies. But before that, composers had to give their stuff away to the students. You can negotiate. I mean, if, if, if you really want to, if you really want to deal with it, you can get an attorney and have a game plan and you can negotiate an alternative to it. I don't know how successful you and I don't know people who have really done it a lot. But basically it says that under, under the terms of work for hire, they own the work, period. They own the work. And more than that, they are the legal author of the work, which is really creepy, okay? Yeah. They do permit uh, composers to, mm -hmm. to receive their performance royalties. But if they want to make a case for it, they can make a case for it. So when you're getting paid, uh, you know, if, if you're working for free, you're working stupidly uh, because you're giving everything away. You're giving your rights, you're giving, and, and then you make nothing at all for, yeah. for a credit that may, may or may not mean anything, you know. So, yeah, the copyright's an important thing. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a problem I've got with copyright right this second. And it involves Silverado. Silverado was um, egregiously copied uh, and turned into a band work. Um, under a different name. And if I play, I think I could play this for anybody that I'm looking at right now, and you'd be able to hear the, the similarities between these two pieces, right? That piece has been going for, oh, maybe 10 years with a publisher, and it's been pretty successful. They still, they still sell it. I'm trying to get the, uh, the copyright owner to sue them. Do you know how hard that is? <laughs> it's really, because like how, how hot is Silverado? It's not that hot. It's, it's a big movie theme and it's very well known and, and you know a lot of people know it, but it's not as hot as let's say the biggest pop thing. So when you don't have control of your publishing, you don't even have control when people abuse it, abuse your music. Yeah. If I tried to take Silver Auto and use it in another movie, I could get sued because I don't own it. You know, that's how, I mean, that's how tough it is. And then uh, the other question I had was about the the placeholder music that they use when they're when they're mocking up scenes oh, temp tracks yeah. temp tracks yeah. have, have you had much problem with producers or directors because you didn't sound like their temp track yeah yeah what a temp track is temp means temporary so a temporary track is the music that every movie maker will use uh, even student films every every music every filmmaker will use to see how their scene is playing uh, in the old days when we had film, and when even music was recorded on film, it was hard to make edits and things. So they didn't have a lot of temp track. But they had it even 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. So what they would do is they would temp track the, they would put music in for the main title to give you a feeling like this was, a, you know, a big epic or, or there was a big romantic sob story, whatever it was. And then they, they would very often use music under a, a montage scene. So they got to send, the editors would cut to it. So they would give them sort of a rhythm to cut to. Now that we're in digital world, it's really easy to put music anywhere. And I, I've seen some of these shows. Um, I did an animated show. I did the sequel to Bambi several years ago and they had it completely temp track. And it was a really good job. I mean, if they had put it out as a score, it would have been, it would, I mean, it wouldn't have been great, but it would have been 
not horrible, you know. It wouldn't have had people running from the theater. Um, the trouble with temp tracks is that when they are, when the music has been in there for a while, the people who put it in are used to it. They get used to it. And even if they didn't like the music when it first went in there, they put it in there for a reason. They either put it in for the pacing or because of a high note or a low note that came at a certain time, or you know, all sorts of things. Once they get used to it, it's really hard to move them. So um, some people get to be kind of rigid on wanting to hear their temp tracks, meaning that they put you in the position of having to write things that sound similar, but you don't want to write anything that sounds that similar, otherwise you'll get sued, right? Um, some, some people are very reasonable about it. For instance, um, one of the jobs I did in the last couple of years is I wrote the, um, I wrote the main title and the pilot episode to Seth MacFarlane's show, The Orville. Um, Seth is a really musical guy. And um, he let me do what I wanted to do for the theme. He, he was just happy to hear what I came up with. So that was fine. But when we got to do the show, he had the whole thing temp tracked. But he did it himself. And I say he's a real musical guy. He has, um, he has lots of, um, he has lots of TV scores and movie scores on his, on his handheld. And um, if he's trying to explain something to him, he'll, within you know, two minutes, he'll show you the cue, you know, that came from that Star Trek episode. Earlier. So he had, he had tracked it and he said to me, he said, I'm only putting this music in here to give you a sense of the coloring of the scene, of, it, of the scene's tone. I don't want you to do this music. You don't have to pay any attention to this music except for the tone of it. That meant that I had, you know, I could do entirely what I wanted to do. And since the music is only there to tell the story best, this guy, who is the creator of the episode, and I think wrote the episode, and, and he's certainly the creator of the, the whole series, is telling me what he wants to get out of his script, what he wants to get out of his story. So in that particular case, the, the temp track wasn't, wasn't a bad thing. I didn't have to make anything sound like something rather. But I've been in cases when, you know, the director said, shouldn't the melody go up there instead of going down? And, and you're like, excuse me, it's my melody, you know, but because they get stuck with some idea, you know, what it's supposed to be. A lot of composers hate temp tracks. Some composers will say, don't show me the temp track, I don't want to know. Um, but, but it, I mean, it, it's often a problem, you know, it's often a creative problem. Okay, well, thank you. That, that, was, that was what, anybody else have any questions for Bruce? Patrick? Gibson? Thank stage. you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, it's an honor, Mr. Broughton. Uh, I'm a great fan. I, I'm going to be a little nerdy for a minute. I really love, and maybe you can speak to this. This will be my question. Your score for it's a Disney attraction in Epcot for uh, Spaceship Earth mm. uh, years and years ago, particularly your theme and variations, just moving through all of the different scenes. Uh, it's so well done and it works so well telling the story. Do you have any memories of that or, or were there any things, any techniques you were using uh, that would be good for those of us who are uh, learning composition? And thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, I'll, I'll tell you one thing was, I, I've done a lot of theme park things for Disney. I've, I've done really a, a lot of them. And I really enjoy it. I enjoy that in animation because um, there's no last minute thinking. These guys are really sharp. They know exactly what they're producing. They know how many people are going to watch it. <clears throat> they know how to get people on and off safely. All of that is part of the conversation when you're talking about the score. Um, I did have a problem initially with it, though. As I said, I've done a lot of these things. This was the only show that I ever had a problem with my theme. Um, I had done so many of these, and I, I had acquired sort of a Disney-esque Disney theme sense, you know. And for Spaceship Earth, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do something a little bit weird. So I came to them with what I thought my theme was, and they didn't like it. They didn't understand it. They didn't think it was any. So I went back and I reworked it, used kind of the same ideas, but reworked it. Went back a second time and I thought, mm, oh, this isn't working. This isn't, you know, this is a problem. This has never happened before. And went, oh, gee, this is really a drag. So it took me three tries before I got the theme that, that, that we worked on. So that was the creative problem. But it did have a creative problem, such as you're talking about, a creative musical problem, and they didn't know how to solve it. In Spaceship Earth, say Spaceship Earth is, there, for those of you who don't know, it's at Epcot, and it's, it's in that big round um, thing that's, at, that's the uh, iconic uh, symbol of, of Epcot. Um, and it's a tram ride that goes through, that's, uh, goes through history. And the first thing you do is you, you meet um, primitive people, and then you go into things like um, 
Rome and Egypt and Phoenicia, you know, all these things. And these are animatronic figures uh, acting out some scene from ancient times. And they're in a room probably about as large as your bedroom, you know, maybe a little larger. And they're right next to each other. So the tram is going along and sometimes the tram stops, which makes it look like there's some problem. But actually the reason the tram is stopping most often is for a safety reason. Uh, maybe somebody who's, who is crippled or handicapped has to get on the tram. So they want to make sure that it's safe. So they'll stop the tram. They're really concerned about security. But this gets in the way of your, of your creativity. You know? So they say, okay, so here's the problem we have. <clears throat> Phoenicia, Egypt, Rome, they're in three different rooms right next to each other. And sometimes the, tra the tram stops and you might be stuck between two different rooms playing two different kinds of music because each, each room has to have its own kind of music. We don't know how you're gonna solve that. Well, actually they had already solved it and didn't realize it. Um, it was actually an easy thing to solve. Uh, if you've been to Disneyland and have you ever been on It's a Small World, you know, um, they solved it right there because what, what It's a Small World is, is this very slow ride, this little boat ride, and all these little puppets singing the exact same tune with different words. And so, and with different arrangements, if you ever notice that. So the, the ones who are dressed up in later hosen are singing, singing It's a Small World, it's a Kleine Welt, you know, or something like that. And then you go to the, um, do you go to the uh, Middle Eastern people or you go to the Africans or you go to the Irish or, you, you know, they go through this whole thing and all of them are singing the same tune. It's always in the same key and in the same tempo with the same chords. That's how that they can, that's how they can do this. And that's why you can listen to three or four of these things going at the same time and never be bothered by it because the tune is, is still going at the same time. So I did the same thing for these three or four th things that were together and, and Spaceship Earth has a, has a ton of them. I would write what in music we call a shikan. One of the things you study, you know, in music history, and you need this stuff. Uh, you never know when you're going to use them. I wrote a shikan, which was a, um, a chord um, sequence. And then over that chord sequence, I wrote the pieces so that all of them could play out, be played on top of each other. And then on my sequencer, I put four or five of them together, however many I had, and played them all at once to make sure that they all played together. And that was how I solved that problem. And it was really a cool problem. Um, the other thing was that everything in, everything in um, Spaceship Earth is on a loop. Nothing comes to an end. So it's continuously music playing all the time, all the time. The one thing that I didn't prepare for and that I didn't realize until I took the ride myself after it was done was the noise of the tram. And I realized that when my music got to be soft, which it did sometimes, in those earlier sequences, it just completely wiped out the music. <laughs> so next time, we what, what you probably didn't notice in Spaceship Earth is that it was a redo of their system and they didn't redo the whole thing technologically. So not everything is in stereo. A lot of those little things are done in mono. They just have one little speaker there. But it's done in a way because of this, this Chacon thing that you can drive through the medieval time and the Renaissance and have all this music playing that's completely different from each other. There's a girl on one side that's playing a lute. Uh, he's playing a lute and, and somebody else is playing a violin. There's a uh, boy soprano playing, singing something in, um, in Latin. Uh, there's a thing with Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel. There's four or five pieces all built, all running at the same time. But some of them are running in, in mono and some are running in stereo. It's a, they're, they're great jobs. I mean, they're really, and the, the cool thing is they were supposed to take it down recently. They were going to make another edition, but COVID stopped them. So it's still playing and the park is open. So some of these shows last a long time. I had one at Epcot called Ellen's Energy Crisis um, or Ellen's Energy Adventure with Ellen DeGeneres ran for 20 years and it was great. I mean, it still pulled people. It was really a lot of fun. And that, that, that's a case when you know that the music that you've written has been heard by literally millions of people. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, it's very cool. All right. So we are out of time. Uh, and so again, thank you so much, Bruce. Thank you, class, for, for listening. Yeah, and uh, we next week. And Bruce, thank you again. Yeah, thank you all. Always a pleasure. Okay, thank you.